invite Paul Ryan to come and speak to us. Paul comes from a farming background with the farming in his family blood since the 1860s. Paul's also the founding director of the Australian Resilience Centre, a company that aims to increase the capacity of individuals, communities and organisations to face future challenges. Amongst his, mo his notable list of works are uh, an advisory to federal, state and regional agencies on resilience concepts in natural resource management and planning, his appointment to the International Union for Conservation of Nature and work with the CSIRO coordinating ecological and multidisciplinary research. In 2012, he founded the Resilience Planning Community of Practice, an Australian-based network of resilience practitioners. Today, he is talking to us about growing the land care legacy. Please welcome Paul. Well, thanks everyone. And, uh, I'm really thrilled to be here. I, I set off yesterday morning on, a, on the journey to the airport to get across over here and I crossed over the Murray where you can throw a stone on it uh, across the river and um, it's nice to be uh, uh, down the other end of the river where it's um, the mighty Murray. It's really impressive. Um, what I want to talk about today builds a lot on what Sue was just talking about, sustaining the legacy of Landcare. How do we think about sustaining the amazing legacy that Landcare has built over 30 years and how do we project that forward? What's the legacy? What's the future legacy of Landcare? Uh, and as um, was mentioned in the introduction, I'm going to use resilience concepts to talk about that, but I'll get to that in a minute. As Sue mentioned, we're, we're a continent in transition. We don't really know where we're heading in the future, but we know lots of important things are changing. The big drivers are changing, and we can't really say where we're going to end up. But we know some of the main drivers uh, on, on our landscape are changing. The most obvious one, of course, uh, that sits across the top of all of us is, land, is, uh, is climate change and how that'll affect land management. And this is a, a map uh, produced by CSIRO, some modelling that looks at the, the ecological envelope, if you like, of any point in the landscape uh, and compares that now to 2070 under a high uh, climate change impact scenario. And what it tells us is what's the difference between now, the, the climatic envelope that sits there, the ecological envelope that sits there, and what it'll be like in the future. The darker the purple colour, uh, the more significant that change will be. And what this tells us is across most of the country, we're likely to see substantial change, substantial change to the ecosystems, to the landscapes. That means we're going to see substantial changes to the things those ecosystems deliver to us, the services and benefits that ecosystems deliver to us, food and fibre, the way we enjoy landscapes and, and obvious changes to biodiversity. So some major challenges there. We know that communication's changing. Sue touched on this, but the, the rate, the speed of communication that's changing. Two and a half emails, a million emails that sent every second. Um, seems like a lot of those land in my email box and then I just have to ignore them. 10,000 tweets a second, 40,000 Google searches a, a second. We, we've, we've now crossed a point where we can connect to just about anyone in the, on the planet uh, electronically, something we've never been able to do before, and at a scale and a rate that we've never been able to do before as humans. Uh, and we can pull down information from a much uh, wider network than we've ever been able to do in our, our history. Keep in mind that uh, there was no internet when Landcare started, for example. Uh, and Australians are huge adopters of this. We're the most uh, socially, uh, socially media connected um, people on the planet and so we've got this incredible web of, of um, connection across Australia through social media. We know that our demographics and social systems are changing and if there's nothing new about that they've always changed uh, from pre-European times to post-European there's been lots of change but there's some particular patterns starting to emerge. This is a map of um, demographic change in local government areas and the darker the colour uh, the higher the, the um, loss of population and what's important here is that you probably can't see it too well from the back, but most of that demographic change has occurred within the 500 mil rainfall isohyte. So in other words, people moving out of the low rainfall country. Uh, and that doesn't mean they're necessarily moving to the city. They might be moving um, to another region. We know there's lots of um, uh, lifestyle type movements of people out of cities, out of some regions into others, people retiring to the coast, those sorts of things. Um, but but there's some particular patterns I think have got real implications for land care and thinking about the future of land care and how we sustain it. This is a, a diagram from, um, from New South Wales. I couldn't find one from, from South Australia. But what it talks about is the, uh, 
the population growth and decline to 2030 in New South Wales, and there's a couple of really important patterns emerging there. One is uh, in western New South Wales, in that lower rainfall country, you can see the, the loss of population in those towns there, those red arrows where population is declining. And then the large regional centres on the, the inland slopes of New South Wales, uh, Armidale, um, Tamworth, Wagga, uh, Albury, uh, large regional centres. And so we've got this pattern of aggregation to these large regional centres and a hollowing out of the demographics in a lot of smaller centres. So if you go to towns in Western New South Wales, your north, uh, you know, far north and north, uh, Western Australian wheat belt, the Mallee in Victoria, you see the same pattern in smaller towns and communities. Uh, the missing demographic is the middle demographic. There's lots of young people and lots of old people, but basically the people that are mobile tend to move out of those areas. That's got real implications for when we think about the future of an organisation like Landcare. Of course, uh, and the other big change is the technology change, partly it's related to to, um, to communication, but this is an astounding statistic. This was released a few weeks ago by CEDA. Five million Australian jobs, around 40% of the workforce, a high probability of being replaced in the next 10 to 15 years. That's an astounding statistic that we, I think we, you know, we're on the verge of a massive social change that we haven't experienced before. In agricultural landscapes, we've already seen lots of technology adoption, but it's going the next step. I was at a conference in um, Narrabri a few weeks ago, a cotton conference, and people were talking about um, robotic uh, spray carts. And you know, this is an example of one. So they don't have a driver, they run around doing the spraying on properties. This is commercially available, and industries like the cotton industry are talking about widespread adoption of this within a few years. Um, I've got a, a cousin who's an irrigator in northern Victoria. Um, and I was talking to him the other day, and they've gone for fully automated irrigation. So not only uh, can he, is he separated from his property? He doesn't have to be on the property to do the irrigation. He can do it from his, his iPad. Um, he was talking to me from a beach in Spain, the lucky bugger, while he was doing his irrigation at home in Northern Victoria. The separation of people and place, I think, has got real implications for land care and how we think about the future. Uh, this is a robot in, in California working in a greenhouse that goes up and down on tracks in a greenhouse growing capsicums and it works 24 hours a day, seven days a week and can accurately pick capsicums and pack them. The, these changes are, are going to come to agriculture that's going to change rural landscapes and there's nothing we can do to stop those because it's, this is about efficiency in terms of trade, those types of things. We can't stop those drivers, they're macro scale drivers that impact uh, we can't do anything about those. We have to understand how do we work within those, how do we adapt to those. And of course, so they're just four big changes and Sue mentioned a couple of others as well. These sorts of changes, they don't act in isolation, they interact. They, they co-evolve over time together. So as one changes, it influences the other and they interact together as they develop through time. And we get what's called a complex adaptive system. It interacts over time and responds to each other. The challenge for us is to work out how do we interact within that changing context? What's the future for an organisation like Landcare? How do we sustain what started as a place-based social network, strongly attached to, to place, uh, and see how do we sustain that legacy, that amazing legacy from all of these thousands of people and groups around Australia working uh, at a particular approach to the way we do our business? How do we sustain that as lots of things have changed in the context around us? One way to think about that is resilience, and we heard that Sue touching on the concept of resilience, and there's a reason for that. Lots of people talking about resilience. I should have updated this. That should be ex-Prime Minister, you should see up there. Um, uh, you know, pick up a newspaper, turn on a TV, turn on the radio, you'll hear the word resilience. Yesterday on the plane I was reading the sports section, uh, six mentions of the word resilience, mostly by people who are getting flogged in one way or another, uh, talk about resilience. Um, <laughs> But my favourite use, popular use of the word resilience is by this, um, you know, the highly regarded um, research organisation, the Estee Lauder Makeup Company in, um, in New York. Uh, you probably won't be able to read it there, but this is resilience cream. And when I first heard about this, I thought, <laughs> could we put this in the water? Could we lather ourselves in it and we could withstand anything? Um, but then I looked at the price, which you probably can't see, but it's um, uh, $98 for 15 mils, which... <laughs> I worked out must make it the most expensive liquid on the planet, far more, uh, you know, more, more expensive than the precious water we were talking about earlier on. Uh, 
Um, so lots of, lots of talk about resilience, but I would say a lot of this is just empty talk about resilience. Resilience is a science. There's a whole science behind resilience. It's been around for 40 or 50 years, and there's lots of people around the world now engaging in the idea of resilience and its co-related concepts of adaptation and transformation to think about the sort of changes that we're trying to think about. So if you Google resilience, you'll get a definition that looks something like this, the capacity of a system, and a system can be a farm, an ecosystem, a social system, a network like land care or an industry, um, to self-organise, so to get its own act together in the face of change and cope with major changes while retaining the identity it wants to retain, its desired identity, or if that identity is no longer viable, to create a new identity, to create something new, to deliberately to change. I haven't got time to talk about all of the concepts in resilience. I'm going to touch on just two really important ones that I think are relevant, and that's this idea of the adaptive cycle and, the, um, and networks, and I'll talk about what I mean by those in a second. So the adaptive cycle, this, is a, this concept comes from ecology, but it's highly relevant to thinking about the sort of things we're talking about um, today. Uh, what it says is that systems go through a period, they start off, they start to grow, uh, the, the purpose of the system is to expand and to grow and to get bigger, and we can see this, uh, and I'll give you some examples in a second. But over time, a system can't continue to just keep growing. It starts to, the strategy starts to change and it becomes conservative. Now, this is not about conservation as in national parks or conservative as in political. It's about the strategy, being conservative, about uh, retaining resources, uh, retaining connections, uh, retaining structures. So the system starts to look inward rather than looking outward as it does in the growth phase. But as you try to keep a system the same and retain it, keep it at that same point, eventually it becomes brittle. After a while, it starts to become vulnerable to smaller and smaller changes. Uh, and we heard Sue talking about shocks. And the and system will experience some kind of shock, and that shock might push it over the edge, and it goes through a collapse phase. This is when it, uh, a system is, is falling apart. You see the breaking apart, the release of those connections. Uh, it loses capital. It loses potential to do things. Uh, and it goes through a bit of a, a back loop crisis, we call it. But eventually, structures start to re-emerge, networks start to rebuild, the system starts to reorganise, and it'll get back on track. And as I said, this comes from ecology, and we can see this clearly in ecological systems. Think about a forest that's growing. Over time, big structures like trees start to dominate, uh, and eventually very big structures like very big trees dominate, and they lock up all the resources. It's really hard to get a new species in here. There's lots of competition. Things can't change easily in these sorts of systems, but it's very vulnerable, and a single spark can suddenly uh, cause a crisis, a collapse in this sort of system, and you'll see the breaking apart of, of all of those connections, those bonds, but there's lots of opportunity. In this system now, there's light, there's water, there's resources, there's space, there's nutrients are available. And so new species can get in uh, and it could go off in a new direction depending on the dominance of those species that come in. But pretty soon, uh, a, an old pattern will start to re-emerge. If something new doesn't come along, the old structures will start to sequester the resources that are available and the system will start to go in a particular direction. Um, now, I must say, I put this together before what the events happened last night, but one of the, one of the types of organisations that's really interesting to look at is political parties, and I didn't pick this side of politics for any reason. I could have picked the other side of politics. But think about the pattern that this particular system went through, so very stable for a long period of time. Uh, then, of course, a collapse. Uh, John Howard loses his seat in the, in the election that, uh, when Rudd was brought to power. Uh, Think about what happened immediately afterwards. Some really interesting dynamics. You suddenly see the system. There's opportunity for, for opportunists in this system. There's resources. The networks aren't very strong. The linkages aren't very strong. The, the system can go in new directions. Uh, and of course, uh, but pretty soon, the old power networks get organised. The structures start to build again. Uh, and it looks like the system's going to go through another growth phase. Um, the fun and games don't last very long, though, and <laughs> systems sometimes don't get back on a growth path. And I would say what happened last night, and all jokes aside, what happened last night shows that this system is still caught in that back loop. I would also say so is the other side. They're also caught in a back loop. We don't have a clear, stable political system that's going to emerge to take us on a very stable path for a while. Both sides of politics are going through this. But that has implications, these types of changes in organisations, and I could have used companies, I could have used networks, uh, and it has implications for how we think about change and where we go next. These patterns also repeat over time. 
Now, <clears throat> I was, I'm a Victorian, obviously, and um, I was looking for a South Australian example to use here, but unfortunately I couldn't find a successful South Australian team, so I, <laughs> so I, had, to, I had to use a successful one. You also note I've cut off the last from 2012 onwards because the results get a little bit haywire there for some reason. I'm not, I'm not sure why. But, but what this, what this shows is the final ladder position for the, for the Essendon Footy Club for 127 years. So that's the position they finished at the end of the, end of the season. Keep in mind that uh, in the early phases there were six teams, then eight teams, then 16 teams in the competition, etc. What this tells us, it tells us something really important. This makes no sense. This, uh, this organisation has one single objective, and that is to finish as high up the ladder as it can. And yet this is the pattern that was repeated over 127 years. So there's some really interesting dynamics that obviously go on inside an organisation like this and its competing organisations, the other 12 or 14 clubs or whatever, but it's hard to sustain a system in a particular state for any length of time. It, this pattern makes no sense. All the objectives, everything organised within this organisation is about one single objective and it can't stay at any particular state. And of course these, net, these cycles happen at different scales and it's worth thinking about uh, what's happening in land care at different scales. What's really important is one of the counterintuitive things about this cycle is that uh, sometimes when you're at the top of the game, you're to, you're top of your game, that's the time to make change. And that's one of the hardest times to do it. And that's something that's really counterintuitive. We all want to wait until uh, you know, we've gone past the point of no return, we're going through a collapse, and then suddenly we've got a crisis and we want to make change. Second issue I want to touch on is networks, um, and I'm not talking about Landcare networks here, although obviously Landcare is an example of networks, but just networks, the connections between people. And as Sue mentioned, they're powerful, cons you know, networks are powerful. Uh, they're powerful forces for motivating change, norms and behaviours, but they also do other things as well. This diagram represents the social network in a town, co town called Framingham in Massachusetts in the US. It's been used as a study, case study in for health uh, for, since 1948. And that's the social network of all the people who lived in the town in 1948, then their children and their children's children. What's really interesting is that they've tracked sort of social contagions, if you like, how things transmit through the network. And you can see there, if you know someone who's happy, you're 15% more likely to be happy yourself. And then if you know someone who knows someone who's happy, you're 10% more likely to be happy. Uh, and right out to if you know someone who knows someone who knows someone. That's really great. Uh, lots of, you know, that's really positive if we want to transmit positive things. But it also transmits negative things. Obesity. If you know someone who's obese, you're 45% more likely to be obese. If you know someone who smokes, you're 60% more likely to smoke. That's both good and bad. What it says is the power of networks uh, is, is very strong in, in um, helping people to transmit and to organise things, but it also often might block change. It might block us from thinking about things. These two, these two um, pictures side by side here, on the top, both of the, the um, networks on the top represent people who are incremental changers. This is um, surveys from farmers in Australia to more than 200 farmers in different in industries. This represents networks, uh, that, that this represents individuals who are incremental changers on the top and on the bottom, these are people who are transformational changers, people who want to make large, significant changes uh, in their agricultural enterprise. What's really interesting is when you look at the social networks of, of, um, of transformational changes that's on the bottom left there, they're really weak. They're not very strongly socially connected. Transforming people, transformational people are socially uh, disconnected. They're quite um, isolated in their social networks. In contrast, uh, people who are making incremental changes have really strong networks. On the other side, if we look at their information networks, people who are making transformational change have very extensive information networks. They're highly connected outside their, their um, social system into other information networks, uh, and you get the reverse for incremental changes. They're, they're, they've got weak uh, information networks. What does this tell us? Well, some interesting things. That looking at um, uh, a part of this work was also looking at just one subset, the peanut farmers. 88% of the farmers showed a strong negative correlation between transformational capacity and place and occupation attachment. In other words, if I'm a peanut farmer in Kingaroy, I want to stay a peanut farmer in Kingaroy, regardless of whatever comes over the hill at me. Those people had low capacity to change. That's an important message for us thinking about with all of the changes that are coming and all of the sorts of the degree of change we need to make uh, for us to, to cope with the future.
Um, we did some work in Victoria looking at networks and people identified tight social networks. Obviously, when you ask them about their social network, they talk about their neighbourhood, their neighbours. We all have to get on with our neighbours. We understand that. Um, we asked them about their service network, so they, their bigger social network where their kids go to school or sporting clubs, and that was all spatial. All of that was spatial. When we asked them about their information and their inspiration, it wasn't spatial. It was, it was this inspiration network which is disconnected from place, and that's got important implications for land care. So what's the future of land care in this changing context? Well, a couple of things. What's, I think you need to ask some key questions. What's the role of land care in this transition from the Australian continent? Are we about leadership, about inspiration, about innovation, support for others to change, about being a connector or a bridge? And I know people would be sitting in this room saying it's all of those things. All I would say is it's hard to be all of those things. You need different skills. Where's land care on the adaptive cycle? Is it in a growth phase? Is it in a conservation phase? Is, is it in a collapse or reorganisation phase? And it's not for me to say, and it's, it's different at different scales, whoops, and different scales, uh, and you know, at the group level versus state versus national. But all I would say is think about, are you building capital? Are you building connections? Or are you shedding those? And what's the implication of that for the next phase, where land care goes next? Um, think about the neighbours and not versus knowledge networks. Land care has been a place-based concept. Um, is that the best concept, the best approach for us to have with all the future challenges we've got? Um, what model's best to help people adapt? What model's best to help people transform? We saw about contagions and, and how well networks can both facilitate things, but they can also prevent change, and we need to think carefully about that. And lastly, is land care about incremental or transformational change itself? What's its message? And I think if, uh, if land care can answer those, ask and answer those types of questions, then I think land care can go a long way to, towards sustaining its legacy into the future. And I'll leave it there. Thank you.